I think you'll all know about um, the mutiny in the 1987 boat race um, team, which was made to, later made into a film um, with Dominic West playing Donald. Um, I would have quite liked to be playing Donald's girlfriend, but there we are. <laughs> um, if that's not an inappropriate thing to say about Dominic West, but there we are. But I wanted to just um, thank you very much, Donald, for um, everything you've done for Mansfield, and in particular through establishing the True Blue Trust. Um, you told your story and the inspiration um, it brings us on a number of occasions. You've incorporated advice on leadership, uh, managing conflict, decision making, um, motivation to win against the odds. And you've given that talk to corporations who have in turn given donations to Mansfield. Um, and we're very grateful for that. And also for your continued work in introducing us to potential new supporters for college, which is very much needed and um, hugely kind of you. So thank you. Um, and I'd also really very like, much like to thank Chris, who's a very senior leader in professional sport and is perfectly placed to um, encourage uh, Donald to answer all the questions which I know you'll want to put to him. I'll try and hold back, family hold back. Um, and Chris has also supported Manfield um, very generously through development of an ambitious new sports plan for college that I hope one day might um, continue to uh, help us win on the river. Um, I say one day uh, because uh, unfortunately this was the year that never was for Mansfield rowing and all Oxford rowing um, because not only have we had plague, we've also had fl floods. Um, but the, uh, so it's been very difficult to get out on the river. Of course, as you'll know, the boat race was cancelled, which is particularly gutting for Mansfield, which as a very small college had no fewer than three um, rowers in the squad, two of whom had never rowed before they came here. So um, that's very disappointing, but I'm sure they would have won if, if they'd been rowing. So let me just br briefly introduce you in a bit more detail to our two speakers tonight, and then I'll shut up and let them do the speaking. So Chris Jenkins um, was a PPEist at Mansfield, graduating in 1980. He coxed our first eight for three um, years and was captain of boats um, for at least a couple of those. And then after college, he coaxed the London Welsh um, Leander and, and he represented Wales, including competition at the Commonwealth Games in 1986. And Chris has been the chair of Welsh Rowing and a director of British Rowing. Um, not only that, but he's also worked very successfully in the City of London as a fund manager and was a director at Rothschilds for over 20 years before moving back um, wisely, perhaps in current times, to Wales and joining the Commonwealth Games um, Wales in 2005. And he's the CEO there now. Um, and then, of course, um, Donald MacDonald. Donald came to Mansfield to study English in 1984, um, already an experienced oarsman. And in 1987, he was the captain of the Oxford University Boat Club um, in the year of the infamous boat race mutiny, where the sudden replacement of the incumbent Oxford crew by a cadre of newly arrived Ivy League oarsmen prompted a vitriolic standoff. And um, this was, this ended up with Donald taking on an untested um, underprepared and underrated Oxford crew with only a few weeks before race day and over 30 years later it's still a very exciting story and I'm going to hand over to you um, Chris and Donald to tell us about it. So thank you both very much, we're looking forward to it. Great, thank you very much. Um, welcome everyone, um, it's a great honour to be here and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the, the chat Donald and I are going to have. We, I have to say, we have rehearsed this a couple of times, just chatting through. We haven't got under three hours yet, so let's see what happens tonight. Um, as, as Helen mentioned, it, it, this is a really bizarre time in a way, because when Donald was at college, there were three blues in Mansfield, and as you say, there were three rows who sadly didn't get onto the water this year, and it's... Yeah, that's, that's one thing I noticed as well. And of course, Oxford was all over the headlines when Donna was uh, uh, changing things around in the boat, which we'll touch on later. And of course, Oxford's been in the headlines again throughout the last few few months or last few weeks with a vaccine and COVID. So there's lots sort of things, you know, bookending this, this conversation, I hope. Um, as you mentioned, I was captain of the boats, a Cox. I suppose that's the ultimate in spectator uh, sport in a sense to sit at the back and shout for a lot of people to pull you very hard and very fast down the river. So I really do feel for those of you who are not out there 
playing sport at the moment. But I guess my first question to Donald really um, is looking all the way back to when you actually came up to Mansfield. I remember my first time I saw it was tapping on the porter's lodge and said, where do they go? And then across the other side of the quad, there was a small light on, which is the principal's office. You had to find your way over there for an interview. So tell me, how did you end up at Mansfield? Why did you come? Because uh, you had a job. What, what drove you to you know, apply? And then perhaps we'll get on to how you started rowing at college. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, good to be here, Chris. And uh, well, it was, it was a kind of realization in my mid twenties. I, I left school and went straight out to work. Um, and, and then realized I'd made a mistake and wondered if I could reverse the situation. Um, and I uh, had always wanted to study English and I felt that Oxford was the place to do it if one could. Uh, and so I actually came down and, and talked to one or two colleges because it felt, it felt like a hopeless, um, a hopeless challenge, but, but I figured I should give it a go. And, um, and I, I got mixed responses, but mo most people, mo most Dons I spoke to um, didn't give me much of a chance and, and, and they felt I'd missed the boat and it was, it was too late. And Mansfield was quite different. Uh, they took a different view. They, they saw past my, you know, the, the fact that I was older uh, and that I hadn't um, really formally kind of completed my education and, and they were willing to, to suspend judgment and, and give me a chance and, and, and give me a chance to take the entrance exam and pitch in with everybody else. And, and I also like the fact that um, John Creaser, who was the, uh, the, the, the senior tutor in charge of English, had himself uh, been a late starter. So uh, I, I felt there was some empathy there, some good, some good vibes. So, so Mansfield seemed the obvious choice. Excellent, excellent. And I mean, when I came up to the Mansfield, I'd never rowed, I think I'd even seen a boat. And I was walking down Mansfield Road one day and my feet went on the ground and someone said, you're light, come down to the river tomorrow. But you, you had rowed before you came up, isn't that right? I had, yeah. So um, w when I came down to, to London to, to start work, um, I'd been a rugby player at school, so I'd never touched an oar. Um, but I figured I'd try a different sport. And so I went down to Putney and, and, and joined one of the rowing clubs there and found out I was, I was good at it and, and progressed pretty quickly. So yes, I, I did have, um, I, I, I was already a fairly kind of seasoned racer. Um, but I, but I, I then got married and, and we moved out of London and I stopped rowing. So I hadn't, I hadn't rowed for about five or six years. Um, and it, it, it wasn't top, I mean, it, you know, I came to, I came to Oxford, came to Mansfield because I wanted to pursue my studies and wanted to read English. But it happened that I was good at rowing, and but it never occurred to me that that I would be uh, good enough at that stage to uh, to trial. It, and in fact, it was Topolsky who I I'd, I'd known a little bit when I was in London, uh, heard that I was at Oxford, and, and said you should. Presumably, I had a very weak squad that year, <laughs> so he said you should, you should come along and and try out. Because of course, you rode at London Rowing Club, which of course was Topolsky's rowing club, yes, yes. As well, isn't it as well? So. For the first year, you, so you trialed, and did you row? F how, how did that go? Yeah, it, it went well. Um, uh, and in fact, it was a good lesson in life because I, I started there thinking, well, this is going to take a long time to get back in the groove. And so I sort of set myself a very long-term goal. Uh, but as it turned out, I very nearly made the, the big, the big boat in, in year one. So lesson being, you know, set your goals a lot higher. <laughs> <laughs> and you might just make it. So, but I do remember those those first days when I arrived because all my kit was years out of date. I just didn't look right, and um, and and all these huge athletes wandering about with their internet, you know, their national team tracksuits. It was it was quite an intimidating place to arrive. But again, I learned that you, you very quickly you get into it, and one by one, you can kind of peg them back. And I, I found I was very quick in a single skull. So. Um, so I could always uh, assert myself on the water. Okay, well, we'll hold on to the single skull, because that's going to be quite relevant later, isn't it? The fact you actually are quite nippy in the single skull, and, was, and still skull today, don't you? Yeah. So your analysis is an 85. Um, good crew, went well? Uh, yeah, the 85 ISIS crew was a great crew. 
uh, we, we were we were pretty quick and, and we won um, without too much difficulty. So yeah, that was uh, very satisfactory. And now we're going to look at 86, which I think, um, you know, was show, really sowed the seeds for what happened in 87. So I'm going to really try and unpack 86 with you a little bit. So you're in the 86 crew. So maybe tell me about that because there'd been a long run. I mean, all the time I was at college and all the time up until that race, Oxford had won. Topolsky was coach. I mean, I know he was head coach, brought in lots of other coaches, what have you. I mean, the way I look at sport at the moment, if you've won for 10 years on the trot, chances are at some point you are going to lose. I mean, it just happens, you know, on the day, someone's having a bad day. Um, but talk us through 86 a little bit and on why that was, was so pivotal. And then I've got a couple more questions on that for you. Yeah, um, you're right. 86 was pivotal. And, and I, I, don't, I think people, when people focus on 87, they, they miss the fact that all the seeds of 87 were sown in 86. So you have to understand 86 to really understand how 87 panned out. And, and in 86, we had a, a, not a very strong squad and Cambridge were very strong that year. And so we quickly realized that we, would have, we couldn't rely on, on superior weight and strength. We'd have to train as a very, like a lightweight crew, like sort of very balletic and very pre you know, technically precise. Um, and it was, it was actually going very well, but then, um, and I think I have to lay the blame here on Dan, much as, uh, much as I love him, um, that, that he made a catastrophic decision in bringing back um, a superstar. There was a guy in, in Oxford called Graham Jones, an Australian who'd won three boat races in a row, but he'd taken the last year off because he had to finish his defil. And Dan got word that he might just be available. And so the 11th hour, with about three weeks to go, Dan replaced um, a very popular young kid who was only 18, would have been the youngest to row in the boat race, um, replaced him with Jones. And that upset the entire kind of chemistry of this crew that we built so carefully. And now we had this incredibly strong, totally different style of rower stuck in the middle of the boat. And, and it also intimidated some of the other, a couple of the uh, semi-international American oarsmen that we had didn't like having Jones there. They felt kind of rattled by that. Anyway, so as a result, um, we had this catastrophic row and uh, we kind of knew we were going to lose sort of days before the race. So it was, it was a terrible way to, uh, to end. And, and I think in the process, um, Topolsky kind of lost his mojo really. He, um, he's very much a charismatic, a charisma type of coach. Uh, and people like him, they coach by others feeling that they can walk on water and yeah. uh, he lost that. Yeah. Cause I think, I think that is so important. I remember, I mean, I remember being in the Welsh boat and I won't say which oarsman it was, but one guy, he wasn't the fastest. You could have brought somebody else in, but we resisted it from the coaches saying, if you take him out, we will go slower. Even if you put in someone who actually pulls harder, because mm. I think it is important to sort of really sort of look at a way an eight works, isn't it? There are, there are units within it, they're very important, seats within it, and it just works together as chemistry. And you make a sudden change by dropping in a superstar, even if they're you know, not as fit. That, that must have had psychologically a real impact on, on the crew. Yeah, I mean, it's hugely tempting for a coach to, they've got this kind of raw material, they're desperate to use it. Um, but that's forgetting, I think, a fundamental principle of team, which is that you know, the whole is always yeah. Nearly always greater than some of the parts, and if you take one component out and replace it, um, it especially with not much time to go, it rarely works, and it, and it didn't in this case. And so that, and because it was ten years that it, um, we overreacted. We uh, yeah. we thought, well, that's the end of the world. We would better do something extreme rather than just rebuilding in a sensible way. Now, is it fair to say more than one of you thought you should do something extreme? Because in a sense, you had Chris Clark who was in the boat. Um, and we'll come back to him a little bit later as well. But he went out and tried to recruit people in the States. And that was, 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 was that the way that Dan approached it as well? That he wanted to bring in some more internationals, having, in a sense, meddled a little bit in this boat. He was then going to try and, try and do it. And do you think, in a way, he kind of over-egged it a bit? Yeah, no doubt about it. And, um, I mean, Dan was always keen to get uh, stars in if he could, because that was always going to be a foundation on which you could build a crew. And Chris Clark, who 
for anybody who hasn't read the book and is familiar with the film, is known as Rick Ross in the film. Um, he he kind of gets the blame for going away and recruiting all these guys. But actually, um, if I'm being honest, it was really Dan, myself, and Chris or Rick together uh, went after uh, some of his um, his U.S. compatriots and tried to bring them and uh, and help them apply to get places at Oxford. And you're right, we in in past years we would have one or two uh, stars. This but never this number and from one place. So, you know, it was. Yeah, going for five out of eight is quite, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that way. So on the basis you've got, you know, ISIS coming through, you've gone through that, that progression. What did the existing oarsmen, the guys who thought, well, I was, I'm in a really good ISIS boat or, or I'm in the, I really am in the running for the blue boat this year. And then suddenly all these guys turn up. How did that affect them, do you think? Well, they weren't happy, and, and, and uh, understandably, because, you know, there aren't very many places in it, you know, it's eight, and most people row, favour one side or the other, so actually you've got four for your particular side, bow side or stroke side, so that's a very limited odds you've got. If you then bring in uh, four, four of these active oarsmen, you, you, you've, you, you know, you've cut your chances hugely, and, and I think, you know, we made... A, a number of mistakes and we, we have to hold our hands up and one other big mistake we made as well as over egging the pudding was not telling people and so we let the whole summer go by knowing that we'd have to face this this announcement which wasn't going to be pleasant and um if we if we'd let people know a lot sooner they could have got used to the idea but they've all been training very hard and we waited till they got back in october and then announced that um we had all these other people that was that was a very foolish thing to do. Yeah, there's going to be trouble ahead, really, wasn't there? Whatever, um, I think, as well. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fault all the oarsmen make. You call it an eight, but really, there's nine. You always ignore the most important person sitting at the back, of course. Um, so you've got all these new arrivals coming in. I mean, the high quality, I mean, one or two of them were, you know, these, these were top class international oarsmen. Um, but they came to Oxford. Um, and would you say there was sort of very much an attitude, well, look, all we have to do is turn up, we, we'll, beat, we'll beat Cambridge, we, we can basically do the minimum, we can have a good time. I mean, talk us through that a little bit, how, how they approach things. That wasn't, that was, yeah, we were very concerned, Dan and I, because um, right from the get-go, there was this feeling, look, just um, leave us alone, we'll, you know, we'll do what's necessary and we'll guarantee you a win on the day. And neither Dan nor I, well, for different reasons, Dan, because he knows the race so well, he, he knew it was a, a foolhardy to assume that the boat race is like a 2000 meter um, international race, it's not. And uh, it's one on one rather than six lanes. It, the distance is different, streams, bends, everything. And from my standpoint, I felt, you know, I had to kind of manage this group and I couldn't have one rule for, you know, the, the stars and have everybody else turning up on time uh, and training very hard. So they, they were quite dazzled by Oxford, uh, understandably, it's an amazing place to, to arrive, um, and ar arrive at, and, and they wanted to make the most of it. They didn't really see that training was going to be too, too vital. So your president, so in a sense, I mean, would it be fair to say that, I wouldn't say you call it dictator, but what you say goes, or do, you, or do you rely on the coaches or, you know, where do you get your authority from or, or, or does it all rest with you? Yeah, well, I think, I think it may have changed a bit since then, but at that time, in theory, yeah, the president was all powerful. So the president selects the coaches um, and, and all the decisions finally rest with the president. But um, given the president's also usually um, trying for a place in the boat, clearly there has to be a separation between uh, the day-to-day -day running of the boat club and selection and training and so I you know, all presidents hand all of that over to the coaching team and rely on them to make the you know make the calls in both training and, and crew selection so it only became apparent that I had full authority when trouble broke out until then it was a, a kind of normal thing I was doing day-to-day -day stuff and Dan and his coaches were running the program 
but but in a sense i think you do yourself a little bit of a disservice because when you read through the books and talking around it's there's an element of the president is going to be stretched because you've got a couple of crews you've got you know the other stuff you've got to study i suppose as well and you and and um so in a sense the president gets protected a little bit but you turn around with the coach and say look don't protect me i've got to win my place in the boat oh for sure yeah yeah you can't um yeah, you, you have to win your place in the boat. You, you can't rely on being protected by anybody. And indeed, um, there's, there were seven coaches, all, all of international standing. Even if Dan, my, Dan, if, 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 if Dan had a favourite, the other coaches would just overrule that. So that, that couldn't really happen. So we've got a really level playing field here. We've got four or five superstars. We've got some disaffected guys who thought they were going to get in and now not. But even so, you've got a high quality boat. What, what was it like when you first went out before, you know, trouble started? Was it fast? Was it impressive? It was. It was. Uh, I don't know how fast it was at that stage because we don't only just got in and got together. But mm. it was immensely powerful. I mean, it was, it was amazing to row in. Uh, and, and these guys were really good. And a couple of them in particular were exceptional. And just watch their blades and to try to emulate what they were doing. It was, uh, it was a privilege. Yeah, they were very, very good. So you've got them, some of them saying that we don't need to train. You've got this problem, as you said, you can't have half the crew training, half the other crew not training. Did you feel you were like picking in the middle? Because you've got Dan Topolsky, the coach, now under a bit of pressure where people say, we're not going to do this. And you've got to try and keep the crew together. Did that really... Test you? Did you feel you have to be diplomatic and keep it together, or were you going to take sides? It was it, it was immensely difficult. Um, and again, another lesson for life: you know, don't don't ever agree to be joint CEO if you're in a company. Um, so and, and so they very quickly found a way to divide and rule. Um, and Dan wasn't always there. He's, he lived in London. He'd come up to Oxford maybe three or four times a week. So it was left to me for the day to day carrying out of his instructions. Um, but it was very easy for them to say, well, I'll, I'll talk to Dan. Or if, or if Dan says something, well, I'll, I'll check with Donald. So it was very, very hard uh, to keep control. And then there was this issue of, the, you know, you're training with the guys, you're kind of part of them, and yet you're also in charge. Um, it was, that, 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 was, that was hard to manage. Yeah. And, and indeed, there's, there's that classic moment in the film, isn't there, where um, I elect to abandon Dan on the on the towpath and I go back in the van. So the, that, that sort of moment where, um, where I have to choose. I, I think I chose wrongly in that case, but, uh, but that, was, that was happening a lot. Yeah. yeah, you were put in a really difficult position there, weren't you? Because I am part of the crew, or I'm going to be with a coach. Coach is under pressure. So it was putting your relationship with Dan under serious pressure, wasn't it? They were almost making you choose sides. Hmm. Or did you see, or, or is it fair to say this became a Clark to Polsky power battle? Is that fair? There's that going on as well. Um, Clark uh, had decided he didn't, well, gradually uh, Dan's authority was kind of melting away, driven largely by um, a very powerful character called Dan Lyons, who in the film is called Dan Warren, this guy with the naval uniform. And he's a bit older and, and a, a very strong character and a man with a mission. And Chris, or Rick Ross, um, was a much more laid back Californian type who, um, you know, if pe people wanted to fight battles on his behalf, go ahead. He was relaxed either way. Um, but, but he didn't particularly like uh, Dan and what Dan was doing. So he was very happy to see others try to undermine Dan and, uh, and, and put him to one side. And they felt that I should come along with them and, uh, uh, and I kind of promote their, their way of training. Mm. So they're out training. And then the first, I always think, the first big test when we used to be on the tideway watching you guys train was the fool's head. When you would obviously split into two boats or sometimes it'd be three or four boats from both Oxford and Cambridge peppered around. How important was that? Because that was, to me, when I'm looking back and looking back at it, again, that was one of the key turning, well, it wasn't a turning point. It's actually started to illustrate that there was not just trouble ahead, but there really was quite serious trouble brewing. Yeah, so it's one thing to just have arguments about training, but quite another thing when, um, when, when your actual performance is laid bare. So I mean, that, that, that force head, which happened in October, was, was pivotal because um, 
first of all, Dan had mixed up the crews because he wanted everybody to meld into a kind of consistent style. And so, but I, at the 11th hour, literally the night before the race, um, I was uh, accosted and told that, um, that the, these guys wanted to row as a unit. And they were pretty spooked by having to row with other people. Um, and once again, it was this, you know, and the film brings it out very clearly, you know, you go and tell Dan, you're in charge. So, um, but actually it's very ironic because now they were completely exposed as a, as a, as a unit and, and their result was terrible. And so I think that, that made everybody kind of sit up and think, well, hang on, you know, we, they're clearly very good. You know, they've won medals at the highest level. They are very, very good, but it, it isn't working here at Oxford. And it may have been bearing out some of what Dan was saying, which was the, you know, that's, that race happens on the boat race course. It's not a 2,000 meter sprint. It's, it's complicated. Uh, and, and they made a bit of a mess there. Yeah, and also it's the tideway. And I think if anyone hasn't rowed or caught the tideway, it is, it is quite different. You know, there's all sorts of eddy streams. You can, you can do all sorts of things on the tideway that you probably can't do um, on, 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 on the ISIS or on the track. Um, so there they are. They haven't performed very well. We're now going into the, I guess, the phase. Did you realize at that point you had a lot of trouble coming? That they, I mean, not necessarily a mutiny was coming, but you had a serious problem. You had superstars not performing very well. Cambridge were going to be a very good crew that way. There's still time to do something about it. What was going through your head in sort of October, November time? Yeah, I, I was thinking, how am I going to sort this out? Because it's, um, I expected these, these guys to lead from the front. Mm. But, and, and Dan was, um, Dan kept records of every performance. So he had a very clear and objective uh, uh, landscape of, um, of, of performance stats building. And, you know, at best, they were kind of middle rankers. They weren't outstanding. Um, and that was very disturbing. And, it, and in fact, it was spooking the British contingent, um, you know, the, 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 if you like, the rank and file oarsmen who were looking for leadership, wondering, you know, if, if they're so special, why aren't they performing? So that it was, it was worrying and, 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 and the problems accumulated. So, you know, we had that famous scene at, uh, at Radley where they refused to go out for a second outing. And it, that was a kind of open rebellion and uh, yeah, very, very difficult to handle. And that open rebellion, was that the first time that Dan really understood that he had a serious problem? Because I guess, Initially, it's we brought in these all inter these internationals. I can gel this into a crew, and then suddenly at Radley, it's like I am now being seriously challenged. Yeah, because he'd never been challenged before by anybody, and um, and he'd always managed to get difficult characters to work within the team, just by sheer dint of his personality. But now he's faced with this group, uh, a very strong-willed group, who all acted as one. And yeah, that, that scene at the Radley Boathouse uh, was the first time it became clear that he wasn't going to be, be able to persuade people with his charm or his charisma or his personality. They were determined they weren't going to do what he wanted. And, um, and it was at that point, actually, that he, he resigned because um, I, I got in the van and abandoned him. <laughs> and, and I rang him that evening and he said, no, I'm out. So things had got to a pretty bad stage. By November. Yeah, they weren't good, were they? Let's put it, put it mildly. Um, not helped by the fact the president was kind of, I mean, there wasn't much you could do. You either got in the van or you went, I guess, and went across to Dan, in which case you were walking away from the crew, which is your crew. Right. With hindsight, that's exactly what I should have done. Yeah, that wasn't, uh, was, uh, you know, I can't undo it now, but yeah, I, I should have made it very clear that uh, I was standing shoulder to shoulder with Dan and but we can't undo the past, so off we go now. Um, so I guess we should probably get in some sort of order now, because it does get quite complicated with various um, machinations. But there comes a point when Dan decides to t to try Chris Clark on the on bow side, isn't it? Switch sides. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so when did when did that happen? Was so that after this? So um, we uh, pretty much all the strongest oarsmen were on stroke side that year. So. Um, Dan asked uh, two of the, of the stroke siders, Chris and a guy called Tom Cadu Hudson, who was a, an exceptional oarsman, a British guy, she doesn't get mentioned enough, a bronze medalist. And uh, 
he asked both of them to switch sides. So, uh, so they've been they've been rowing on our side right from the beginning. See, so, okay, that that's good. So, you've gone through that that situation now where um, you've gone through Radley. You're back in you're back in training. How did you get Dan back on side? Because he's just been well, he's resigned. He's been dumped basically by his president and crew. How did you get him back on side? Well, he um, yeah, I mean he. You have to understand how, what, what an iconic figure he was. He still is, but he, he was huge back then. And I thought, well, I, I can't have this. You know, I'll never be forgiven if I'm the president who's lost to Bosky. So um, I, I asked him to give me a few days. And in fact, I convened a meeting in, um, in Mansfield, in, in the council room there, and got them all together and got some of the ex-Blues. That chap Jones was still around, so he came, Boris Brankov, some another famous old Blue Hydra. Um, and we thrashed it out and they, they made it clear that the thing that most bothered them, that they could never get used to, was the fact that Dan could call them up day or night, any time he liked, and make them trade. Um, and so we, so we had to agree a kind of unionized um, time schedule where they'd be prepared to trade, uh, called core time, I remember. So, <laughs> so um, it's, it's so funny looking back. But anyway, I, so I went to Dan and said, look, I think I've, I have a solution, providing you're prepared to, you know, behave reasonably and only ask them to train within this um, period of time, um, will you come back? So he agreed very reluctantly to return. So you had core time when everyone trained and then non-core time when other people had to train as well, is it? Well, it kind of meant that, um, uh, well, everybody who's road knows it's, it's, it's always a shamble. You turn up, the seat's broken or a rig is missing. And they said, well, if that's the case, you, you've got to go find the seat, fix the rigger, um, but that's all core time, so you know if we we row less. We'll row less. Yeah. Oh, God, it's challenging, isn't it? So, so Dan's back involved now. But but my sense as well is 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 every time you came to an agreement, it was sort of nibbled away very quickly. That that you that the pressure was constantly building. So you gave a bit, or you got people back on site, and then the next attack came. Is that fair? Yeah, it was, it was the situation had deteriorated and, and it was very difficult. In fact, it was it was going to be impossible to to really rescue it. And and so yeah, we had Dan coaching and we had we had the crew going out, but uh, but the atmosphere was all wrong. It was, it was corrosive. Um, morale was down. The, the the British, largely British guys, the non internationals. Um, you know, wondered what on earth was going on, and when, when on earth were Dan and I going to actually take charge? Um, and the, the, the international stars were going their own way. So it was it was a very very uh, a divided and, mm. uh, and and difficult time. So what brought it to a head? What, what you know what or was it heads? Because I think it was probably a couple of heads, wasn't it? Mm. And so so what actually triggered triggered that? And you know what? Just take us through what happened and how how you reacted to it. Well, probably the first really major trigger was some. Um, uh, at that time, uh, the main part of selection took place in two fortnights. There was a fortnight before Christmas called the December fortnight, and one just after Christmas called the January fortnight. And they were they were real they were hellish boot camps. Um, and the film, um, if anybody's seen the film, that that, that that that's a very accurate portrayal of what it was like. It was freezing cold, it was horrible, and you, you got no rest, and and people did drop out. In the, in the December one, uh, Chris Clark, Rick Ross didn't turn up. And that was the, the two week period when we were doing most of the seat racing to determine who was going to be in the top boat. And so to, to try to do your seat racing with one of the key people not there, it makes a mockery of the whole thing. And, and that was the moment where we should have said, you haven't turned up, so I'm sorry, you're, you're sacked. Um, but foolishly, uh, and again here, I don't want to lay too much Dan's feet, but, 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 but he's, if, I, if I'd said, Dan, I want to sack Chris Clark, he would have said, you can't, um, I want him in the boat. And, and in fact, we should have sacked him at that point. It's not because, because you can't run, you can't run a team with somebody just to, just I'm not to turn up at the most critical time. But Dan had previous, didn't he? Because he'd just done it in 86 by bringing in Jones yeah. at the last minute. So he was going to try and keep this guy in. Although, I mean, I mean, it might be hard on him, but I remember um, 
in the analysis of 86 race, Spracklin, Mike Spracklin's phenomenal coach said, you know, he wasn't pulling as hard. So there was, there was doubts there already. Um, so they didn't do the boot camp just before December. And anyone who's not rode on the Tideway in December, it's horrible. I mean, I remember lying there in ice as it snowed and you're sheltering under Hammersmith Bridge in the wind. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty unpleasant, isn't it? Yeah, you can't do it. So what happened in the January session? Well, generally, he waltzed back in, so he mm. freshly tanned. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably a wise decision. <laughs> and again, uh, you know, if you're looking from a kind of management standpoint, having taken that catastrophic decision not to sack the guy who hasn't bothered turning up, you then, you're now in a, in a kind of terrible no man's land, which is where we found ourselves, because now he's back and he's saying, so when do I get my race? Well, everybody's raced. You know, <laughs> how can we? So, um, and that's where another kind of, I think, um, we did do a few things right, by the way, but uh, another, I, I would say, catastrophic decision was Dan saying, well, you know, I'll, I'll give you a race then, you can race McDonald." And now by then, uh, uh, the kind of battle lines were become ra rapidly forming because the, the, the US contingent could see there's a real risk that one of their guys, the very guy who got them in, might be at risk. So they kind of grouped around him, you know, formed a kind of shield. Um, meanwhile, the Brits were watching with open mouth astonishment, saying, you know, what on earth is going on there? We're, we're training our not so place in the crew, and, and you're protecting this guy. When's somebody going to call it out? So Dan said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll race him against him. Well, how's that going to work? Because anybody who's done any suit racing knows perfectly well that if everybody knows who the two being raced, and you've taken sides already, you can fix the race easily. <laughs> and, it's and impossible that, not to in a way, isn't it? So, so, then, so then we had the seat race, which was, uh, was a, a, a travesty. Mm. And um, that's a whole, sort of, a whole other topic. But, but just to give you a, a quick flavour, and I, and I don't like kind of um, pointing the finger, but there's no question that the boat I was in, which was stroked by one of Chris's mates, I'd seen this guy row before. He was amazing. And, um, and he was just dropping the blade in and rowing kind of half pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, unless he, you know, when we swap, all he has to do is turn on the, the gas a little bit, and I'm toast. And, and sure enough, you know, he, he, he just kept it low, relaxed, wasn't pulling. We swapped over, and, uh, and Chris beat me, but not very much, actually, about, by about four feet. So Dan said, well, that's fine. Uh, that, was just, that was just to um, indicate whether Clark was fit or not. Um, I've decided he is. He'll be in the crew. And guess who's sacking? The same youngster that got sacked the year before. So yeah. that is the the bit of tinder paper that 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 sparked the uh, the mutiny. Because at that point, the British contingent said, "Enough! You know, how could you, we're not having this youngster who's very popular sacked again just mm -hmm. because you you grown ups can't make a decision." Yeah. And uh, and at that moment uh, they, they they felt well this is this is this is our time we can seize control Tobolsky and McDonald have done nothing to uh to help themselves and it's time to uh take control of the race take him on so yes yeah, so ten, it's Tony Ward wasn't it I think he was yeah. he was out twice I mean it's it's uh, yeah it's, it's really hard on hard on him so now you've got basically you got a mutiny what have you got how did you see it it's suddenly they're they're going to choose the crew how, what were you faced with well i um i, I was kind of blind so I, I knew it was i knew we were in a terrible mess um and and you can see how it's come upon us um it's easy to see all the mistakes with hindsight but they were kind of cumulative um so you make a little mistake and you make another little mistake and it takes you down a, a path that you can't reverse out of it was very hard to and we found ourselves in this terrible position. So I, I knew there was deep unhappiness. I was unhappy I, with the decision. I didn't feel it was right. Uh, I didn't feel the seat race proved anything. I thought it was madness to bring this guy who never turned up and, and fire the other bloke. So it, you know, I was very, very disturbed by the whole thing. The following day, I uh, went down to Oriel Square where we, all, we would always gather. Um, and was and was just and the film is very accurate. Just called into uh, Dan's Dan Lyons Dan Warren's office <laughs> or his room and told 
told that uh, that that I was sacked, and Topolsky was sacked, and that, that they they didn't feel we were running it correctly, and, and they would then take over the race. They would organise their own crew, their own boat, and and they would race. Now, yeah, so so then so so then I had to go home, um, and I you know, the whole thing had come crashing down. I rang Topolsky and said, explain what had happened. I actually thought he would, uh, I expected him to say, well, that's really bad luck, Donald. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you better just uh, take your medicine and the show goes on. But in fact, he was surprisingly, um, he's quite a traditionalist at heart. I mean, he's, he was appalled, he really appalled and, and um, said, well, you know, are you gonna fight this? And uh, I said, well, if, with your support, I will. So one thing, one thing, so you've got, because they actually went out, that, that unit went out, didn't they, a couple of times? Yeah, so we had a, a slight interregnum for, a, for two or three days. Mm. But I, I figured I can't, I'm not going to just go wading in mm. with no preparation. So, yeah. so they, they went out in the so-called so rebel crew and the people were screaming at me and saying, you know, why aren't you doing the thing? What, what's going on? And in fact, I was just patiently doing what I needed to do, which was I rang all the coaches and said, I'm, I intend opposing this, will you, will you back me? And they said, of course we will. I then rang the president of Cambridge and said, look, uh, we've, got, we've got a spot of bother here. Um, will you confirm that you'll only accept a challenge from the president, that's me? And they said, of course, just tell us how we can help. So w w once we kind of closed off those, those areas, th then I felt I could go and, um, and confront these guys. So I think it's a stroke of genius actually ringing Cambridge and saying basically, I choose the crew that goes, I'm the only one who can challenge. Um, so I think that's great because it kind of shuts them out. It's also quite lucky you lost in 86 because that meant you the challenger. If it had been the other way around, yeah. it have been the other way And I think uh, people listening might, might well be thinking, well, with some justification, well, you know, you guys really made a whole mix of this. Um, I'm, I'm kind of with the rebels. And... <laughs> I, and I can't really say anything other than whatever mistakes we made, there are ways of going about things. And what you don't do is what they did, in my view. And, and, and I was, people kept saying to me, well, it's all about choosing the fastest crew, Donald. But actually, I had a bit of a dilemma because without wanting to sound too kind of uh, pompous about it, but I, I, I felt that I, I, had, I had two roles, one to produce the best crew I could. But I also had a kind of role as a um, as the upholder of this ancient, you know, this really special event, and to, you know, to to let it descend into chaos, um, I felt I had a responsibility beyond just that year's race. Yeah, it's very much a governance role, isn't it? You have that historical role. I agree. So, how did you regain control? Because this, you know, they're out on the boat. They're out on the water. They've got a boat. They've got a crew. You're standing in Oxford on the phone with the backing of some coaches and the president of Cambridge, yeah. but you haven't got the boat and you haven't got the crew. So how did you get from A to B? Well, the first thing to do, uh, I had to stab establish who was in control. And so I called a meeting and explained that they were completely out of order um, and that, uh, that they could only row um, through, through, if you like, uh, un under, under the auspices of the president and his coaches. And so we were in a bit of a standoff because they, if you like, could withhold, withhold their labor, so to speak. Um, so we, we were in charge, but, but of nothing. And they had the crew, but couldn't race. So I had to s s then spend several weeks trying to convince them that uh, this was, that they should c come back into the fold. Now, and they, they, and they spent those weeks um, trying to drum up uh, support for uh, a more permanent kind of overturning of, of me and Tobolsky. In the meantime, there were dozens and dozens of different attempts to resolve the selection issues. So, you know, they, uh, and of course the press were involved in a huge way. So there were, there were conflicting stories going to the press. A favorite one being that, that, that Tobolsky was favoring me and, and protecting me. And the, it, even that I was protecting myself using my authority to, um, to insist on a place. Uh, and so, one by one, we had to deal with each one of these. So, and it culminated really in, in, in me calling a meeting of all the coaches and saying to, saying to the, uh, the so-called rebels, look, 
I'll get the, the, the coaches can can review all the evidence and choose the crew. Whoever they choose, I'll stand by it with you. And they said yes. Uh, and so there was, the, the coaches met for nearly an entire day um, in closed session and and came out in favour of me. Um, but that wasn't you know, so. It was now it's best of three. <laughs> so, so that wasn't accepted. And we kept and so one by one we we had to. It, uh, deal with each of these challenges. So yeah, the press got involved because I mean, I mean, for most of us who row, I mean, the newspaper is something you bought and read. You, there was very little rowing coverage, and then suddenly they were everywhere. And it wasn't just the rowing; the the, the newspapers that covered rowing it was everything. Uh, did someone tip them off? How did that happen? Do you think? Because it, it went from nothing to I don't know how it at first got out, but um, but back then, a, any hint of trouble. Mm. on the ISIS, you know, crisis on the ISIS, um, always got a headline. Um, and this, of course, had all the ingredients. Because um, they're pretty photogenic, these guys, the big, tall athletes. So it, 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 it made for good copy. Yeah, Californians just back from the beach. It was pretty cool, wasn't it? Wasn't it? And then they could portray it as a Yanks v. Brits thing, which, yeah. which is, of course, they love. What they did. So you've got the coaches getting, getting back. Um, but you... You still haven't got the boat, you still haven't got the oarsmen in a sense. But how important was ISIS in this going down to talk to them? Because they could be your crew in a sense. That's what the reserve boat is. And we don't expect the entire blue boat to drop out, but you know, that's what they're there for in a sense. Yes, so they were vitally important. And 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 in fact they they too had um uh had their you know they, they weren't they were they were very unhappy as well and weren't sure what to do. Uh, and we, we met them actually in, uh, on the riverbank at Marlow because we'd been coached. That was, it was Sprackton's turn to coach us. And Steve, Steve Redgrave was there, who was actually the ISIS coach. And uh, Steve said that he would go and talk to them. And Steve had one medal at that stage rather than five. And uh, a very young Steve Redgrave went to talk to them. And he said, and he came out uh, 20 minutes later and said, Look, I, think, I think they will row. And, he's, and he said that he'd. He spoke with them and told them, look, years from now, all anybody will be interested in is, did you row or didn't you? And did you win or didn't? So is it all the rest is background noise. So, you know, you guys owe it to yourselves to do what's, what's, what's right for you. So that gave me um, a basis of a crew. Yeah. So you're back in charge in a sense. You're the president. You're going to whistle your challenge. You've got the reserve crew. So how, how many of, of, if you like, the, the mutinying crew, the blue, the, what would have been the blue boat? How many did you manage to get back into the boat, and how many did you have to sack, basically? Or how many resigned? Well, I I, I sacked um, two that I knew I couldn't row with. Uh, no, three. I'm sorry, um, who were the kind of chief ringleaders, if you like. Um, but but in the event, uh, all all five, uh, so the cops and the four rowers. Said, so, look, if 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 we can't all row together, uh, we'd rather not row at all. So, so I lost all of them, um, but the others all reluctantly um, came back. So you lost one. Possible once we'd had that captain's meeting, the, the final meeting that. We'll come on to the captain's meeting because I think that's fascinating, but it must be pointed out that um, there were going to be three blues from Mansfield, and we were now down to one. So two of the people who went actually were. Students at Mansfield. They were, they were, and and all credit to the college um, that managed managed that very difficult situation very well. So, you know, they didn't take sides. They were just, uh, they were just good to good to all of us. You know, they they they. So so Mansfield provided a kind of um, a refuge, if you like, from that great storm. And I think that probably applied to the other two guys as much as to me. So let's touch on the captains of boats meetings, which normally are about, I don't know, start times of torpids. I mean, they're usually not very interesting, but you had two of them, I think, where effectively they were, it was like a coup. They were, they were going to try and sack you, a vote of no confidence. Yes, because it started with, look, we're in charge, go away. And then, and then a gradual dawning that they didn't work that way. And you couldn't just unilaterally decide to take over. And, and so they, 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 before long, they realised that actually the way to do this is through an extraordinary general meeting, get a two-thirds majority to remove the president, and then they are and install their own, and then they were definitely off to the races. So we went through all these machinations, 
um, including me resigning and all sorts of things, none of which were acceptable. So finally, all, all, all points led to that captain's meeting. It was kind of like doomsday. <laughs> so, I mean, I would have to say it's a real lesson. And I think if you go into a meeting like that, you were very well prepared, very well briefed. You got the legal, uh, legal advice, so you knew what the constitution allowed, didn't allow. Um, so just talk us through, just maybe for a minute before we open it up to questions, is how important that meeting was, how you approached that meeting, and um, and the outcome. Yeah, so um, I had, you're right, I, I felt I needed to understand every dimension. So I, I, I studied the Constitution very carefully. I had a rowing buddy who was also a lawyer who helped me just, just make sure I knew what I was doing. And the, the other thing was that we, we got there, and I, did, I simply wasn't able to lobby in the way that these guys could. So they were all over every college bar. And so when, when we arrived at that meeting, it was chaotic. It was noisy, rowdy, uh, and I didn't know where help was going to come from. Um, I did know that my buddy, this Jesuit priest, who very famously made the speech, um, was going to be there. So I was kind of hoping he might speak up. And, and what I learned from that, uh, Chris, was that you, know, you could start off these meetings, it appeared absolutely hopeless. I thought we were going to get crushed. And then gradually, reasonable people start to kind of wonder, well, maybe, maybe there's a reason why you know, the, 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 the level of vitriol and anger was so strong, it was kind of off the scale. And gradually, the reasonable people turned in our direction. And then when uh, Michael Suarez got up to speak, he, you know, the power of oratory um, won the day. And, and we've spoken a bit about, um, you know, in, in this new digital age, back then nothing, it was a, totally analog. So you could use the power of oratory to, um, to get people to change their minds. Whereas today it would have been the sort of Twitter lynch mob. And so it turned out that, um, that we, won, we, we, we won people over, reasonable people over. They could see where we, what we were trying to do. Uh, and, and at that point, uh, we had complete control back, vested with us. And so, as I say, the, the five um, guys from the US uh, resigned, but everybody else came back in the boat. So we had, we had the basis of a, of a crew. So we jumped forward not very long, you know, about a couple of weeks to prepare, I think. So during all the shenanigans, Cambridge have been out there training, getting faster and faster and faster. You've won the day. You're now sitting on the stake boat, having won the day against what was a very well-prepared Cambridge crew. Um, how did you feel? I mean, you're sitting there and we'll come on to Dan's plan in a minute, but what was going through your mind at the, at, at, at the time as you get called up? Because um, the weather was, was beyond bad. I mean, the, 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 the waves were lapping into the boat. It looked like the race was about to be cancelled. And I looked across at um, the Cambridge crew and, and they looked, well, it'd be unfair, a bit harsh to say they looked beaten, but they looked downcast and not up, not really up for it. And, and we had our tails up, because and, and the big difference was that we had really nothing to lose. I mean, if we, if we lost by four lengths, people would call that a victory. Um, they, you know, the idea that they could lose, what they couldn't contemplate, and winning wouldn't be that great. So I thought, well, we're already ahead. That's, you know, we haven't even taken a stroke. So we, we felt strangely calm, relaxed, and, and ready to go. And then Dan's plan was go for the wall. So you're in the Middlesex station. So you went to Fulham Wall to get shelter, yeah. I guess, because it's well, also it's shallow water as well. Not there. Calmer there. Yeah. Not calmer. The Cambridge Cox probably faced that nightmare. Do I cover or not? What do I do? Mm -hmm. and just took us through that bit because I think that's critical. And then after that, you I won't say you've won. It's, an, it's a doddle, but you were in front. Yeah, so, so, so we, we, we got off to a great start. Um, I think so did they. So we were kind of neck and neck. And then we did this dramatic veer off towards the full of wall. Um, and moments later, they veered over to follow us. And again, I thought, strike two, you know, <laughs> we're dictating this race. Um, and, and also we, we had a, a couple of little kind of pushes uh, and the boat moved, we moved on them uh, quite appreciably. And, and I thought, you know, we, I think we can do this. You know, we, I think we've got more pace than they have. Now, it may have been that they've taken on some water, more water than we had uh, for the few 
extra seconds that they were in the middle of the stream. I don't know, but um, but by the time we cleared the Fulham wall and and crossed over um, close to the, on on the way to Harrods, then we were we were starting to dominate. It's interesting because some of the coaches in that last couple of weeks when they were watching were saying they are faster than they think they are. Um, so I remember I was down at the end and we actually saw you. I remember going in. I mean, you never bet on a two-horse race. You don't get odds, but the odds were brilliant. I remember the time I was saying, well, I wonder if we should back Oxford. They actually look quite fast. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you've, you've, you've won the race. You get back to, to, to Mansfield. And I want to touch on just a couple of, just a couple of things, first of all, is uh, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned you were called in by the proctors, so we'll deal with that because you can't not. Um, but secondly, also sort of perhaps touch on how important college rowing is and bumps races and, and in a sense what that meant to you as well. But let's, let's have the proctors first because I think that was that's quite that's a neat. Kind of example of where, I mean, the, the, the intensity of the, of the furore was, was so great that there were, the, the university office, office was getting, the vice chancellor was getting calls from wealthy American donors saying what on earth is going on? Uh, and so the proctors were moved to kind of call me in and, and I had to attend quite a formal meeting where they, where they said, you know, what, what's going on? I said, well, <laughs> you tell me. And, and they said, well, this is, you know, the vice chancellor is due to go to America um, on a fundraising trip. Can't you just put a stop to this? And I said, well, I'm doing my very best, but it's not easy. Do you want to help? <laughs> so, um, but it was just a, a, another sign of how seriously or how serious this had become everywhere in the university. And then coming back to college rowing and, and, and bumps. So, I mean, did, did you row in the college crews? I did, yeah. So I, I rowed in all the eights, uh, summer eights crews mm. and some torpids. I, sometimes I wasn't able to because of training. Mm. Um, but it was, it was great fun, really great. And, and it's a, a hugely important part, I think, mm. of, of college life. Yeah. Um, and, and a massively exciting way to, to race. But yeah. I hadn't realized quite how difficult until I tried it how difficult it is to get a blade. I mean, it's really, really hard. It is very hard, yes, it is. It is that consistency. So that's great. So I guess, I suppose two last questions for me. One is, how on earth did you actually do any English? And you've got a family, and you've got, well, you've got your president of a club that's in complete and utter meltdown and mutiny. So, I mean, but you had to write essays through this, I assume. It's really hard, yeah. I and mean, well, to be fair, uh, and here Mansfield was so wonderful, they, they actually let me, it had become so difficult that they said, or well, I asked them and they agreed that uh, I could take another year. So 87 became a bit, a bit of an academic write-off, which was a great yeah. pity. So I had the summer term to regroup and then the rest of the following year. But up until then, uh, I, I think just a question, and, and other sportsmen will, will probably recognize this, you've just got to be very, very organized. But um, I, I did get tired. Uh, so. It wasn't so much the time taken training as the fact that when you got your books out and were trying to study, you start nodding off. <laughs> you had to kind of, they, they didn't have Red Bull back then, so you had to make, make do. And Alma, the librarian, who's absolutely wonderful, she would, um, she would always look after me in the library and make sure I wasn't disturbed. I well, but you let you have a quick snooze and then yeah. get you back to work. Is that right? Yeah. Brilliant. And then I guess my final question before I open it is that, you know, you look back over those what became four years, you know, at Mansfield, the wonderful times. So, what did you take away from it? Do you think? Um, I mean, everything. It was the foundation for everything that followed. So, mm. it was uh, it was the most wonderful experience. I mean, I, I'd much rather the mutiny hadn't happened, um, but since it did, you know, it, 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 I was very very lucky that we 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 got the, the result we did get. But no, but, but Mansfield but it was just a, such a special place. The, everything from the way the, every, the, the buildings are beautiful. I love the, the atmosphere in college is great. People are, there are no huge egos. You don't, um, there's, some, there's some very, very clever people, obviously, very able tutors, but nobody's, um, every, everybody's pretty kind and pretty, and, and very, very generous. So, so no, I've got nothing but, uh, and, and, and it set me up uh, for the rest of life, really. So it's, it's an immensely important period of my life. Oh, that's great. Now, thank you very much. And um, thank you so much, Don. It's been, it's been a real pleasure the last few weeks chatting through this.